Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived entirely to let me spend much more time than I'd ever get on the radio with fascinating people. Susie Dent, welcome. Hello, James. Lovely to see you. Well, it's lovely to see you too. And, and I don't know where to start, really, because so so multifair. And also, I'm very, very rarely does this happen to me. I'm very conscious of misusing words. Oh, gosh. Do you know, I am the first person who will misuse them liberally. And people often say to me... Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't actually get, write you a text message because I didn't know if I needed to put a semicolon in. Um, I'm not that person at all. I promise. No, I know, but <laughs> still, I, I, I'd get away with it on the radio. But I nearly said multifarious then, and then I stopped myself because I thought maybe that's not actually what multifarious means. Yeah, no, I think it does. Okay. Doing lots of things yes. as long as it's not nefarious. I'm no, happy it, with that. Exactly. <laughs> um, you are one of the most sort of broadcast people in the country because you've been oh. the, the longest serving member of the countdown team but going back to when you were a small child <laughs> sadly not a small child <laughs> but um yes i always say it's just at me and the clock left and then yes. the clock was replaced quite a few years ago <laughs> uh, so yeah i'm i am definitely the, the sort of oldest person there um and no it's great it's yeah i am really lucky from that point of view and i honestly don't even know how many shows there are i think maybe that I've done maybe about 8,000 8, or incredible. so oh, it's just so lucky and yet you've managed to retain privacy is that deliberate yes um, I hope I have uh, yeah I just don't like being above the radar which seems very strange given what I do but it was a complete sideways move getting into telly I didn't mean to mm. um, and it was just an arrangement that the publishers that I worked for had um, with countdown, so it was never on my on my agenda at all. Yeah, but, but you've taken to it. I no, I love it I, <laughs> because it's such a specialised job, isn't it? That I do. It's not yes. not transferable, but it's lovely. But this is this is the incredible thing. It's a job that could have been designed by AI for you. I really. won't be taken over by AI. I have considered this fact. It's going to come to us easily. all in well, the end. Yeah. It's, it's, but you, because it, your childhood. I mean, it's it's absurd, really, how fitted you are to, to the role you grew up in Surrey yes um Catholic independent school so we've got that in common oh okay y your experience looks a little happier than mine was yours uh, horrible well monks versus nuns I suppose now, there's, yeah, a, there's a reality is. tv show I'd watch <laughs> oh that would be fun yes um that is such a good idea um yes it was actually happy it was a happy place for me because it was very quiet it was very ordered and orderly and I could just lose myself in my head which is where I always go um, and there were quite a few lay teachers as well and I didn't board so no. did we, you were at boarding school yes yes you? yes yeah. yeah I think that makes a big difference and, and so you had the best of both of us you had a not, not happy home life and then uh, yeah. someone who I imagine sort of really quite liked school I was yes, yes I did quite like school were um, you a head girl no. Did you have to be a boarder? No. Were you not a public figure in school? Were you, were you? There was. We'd have these assemblies um, at which my sister would disown me because the older she's older than me, and the older um, classes would go behind, and I never brushed the back of my hair because I couldn't see it, therefore it didn't exist. And so she was so embarrassed about me. She just, yeah, I was not her sister. She was very still is very beautiful, very glamorous, and. Um, <laughs> I was very different and they, we'd have these assemblies where head girl and um, house captains and sports captains, you know the drill, would be announced and I was so desperate to have one of those glamorous jobs and uh, I so vividly remember one where um, it was, what was left was either tennis captain or oh, I thought that was it actually so I was completely convinced that's what it was going to be and uh I was then announced as chief librarian. Okay. And the mortification, I mean, mm. it was actually perfect for me, but sure. the mortification that went with it was, yeah, strong. Did, were, were you, I mean, good at studies, I presume? Yeah, I Were just you good at all of them? Were you good loved at Loved it. Yeah, no, no, I'm rubbish at geography. I uh, still am. How can you be rubbish at geography? It's not, I mean. Yeah, I am just really? very. Really? Yeah. Well, Oxbow Lakes and erosion and stuff, or just not knowing um, your way around the country? All, all of, the of the above. I'm afraid. Okay. Um, I'm actually, I've got a reasonable instinct for directions mm. um, but it, give me a compass and that is not really going to help me do anything um, physics also I found quite difficult um, I mean I got through them because I studied hard but they were not things that came easily to me but words did yeah 
And I mean, really early. I, I've heard everyone's probably heard the story of you reading shampoo bottles. I know this is the one I always tell and bore myself. But yes, they were these these amazingly exotic characters even before I could read. Um, hugely boring, obviously. It's not hugely me, boring at all. It's, well, it's... they must be very boring ingredients. Well, oh, I think. see, sort of fenocaline or something like that, yeah, but in Arabic. Exactly, exactly. But, but you, but, but you went on a flight of fancy with that. You imagined other babies in other parts of the world. I did. Yes. Yeah, I did. I mean, I, I wish I can't. It's one of my earliest memories, so I can't actually tell you how old I was. The other one was sitting on a bee. Oh, so bee was yes, one of my first, first uh, words. But, um, yeah, I, it, just, it just occurred to me that I could immerse myself in in the bath and in the world of of these whatever these things were and uh yeah and then so german and french were the things that i gravitated towards first english was a bit incidental actually um and it was only much much later that i came to that was there anything hereditary here did, did either of your parents they weren't linguists not or at all. Not etymologists at all. nothing were no. they very verbose <laughs> No, neither. It's a really weird thing. I think it is because I'm always having this internal dialogue, I, I think. Um, but no, my so my mum worked in an estate agent and my dad was a textile agent. So he did go to Italy a lot, but okay. um, I think his Italian was okay. But, but, but just completely not, self-starting. Yeah. Passion for it. But then if you believe in some kind of mystical attraction, for, for German for me has it. So when I hear it, mm. it is incredibly... I get a really powerful sense of belonging and I have no idea why. Gosh. Um, from the start? Know. From when you first started right studying from the start, yeah. Like feeling like coming home teacher, sort of thing. Genuinely, yeah. Good Lord. Yeah, I know. It's really odd. It is an intensely beautiful language. I know people don't think it is, but it's... it's well, gorgeous. Goethe, I mean, it, it, it's complete this side of the of Europe don't understand it, but the rest of Europe, I think, appreciates probably. it. Yeah, that's probably true, actually. Have you done any genealogy stuff? Have you, like, done that show? No. You must. It's probably going to turn out that you're... I would not. It would be really funny if I, if I did. No, I've not even done one of those kits. Done it yourself. No, don't do one of those kits. We did it on the radio show the other day. All sorts of horrible things can... I'm oh, not really? suggesting for a minute that you've got <laughs> skeletons in your family closet, oh, wow. but, but okay. there's all sorts of weird stuff can come Have out. Have you done yours? Uh, I, no, but I'm adopted, so I... Oh, okay. I kind of don't want to oh, know. Oh, even more fascinating Well, it, potentially, I potentially. I, yeah. I, I should, I maybe one day, but I, I, I'm trying to find out whether... So, what's the German word for the sense of feeling at home when you hear the German language? That's such a good... Um, Probably, <laughs> I don't know, like homeless is a secret. I, I genuinely don't know. There is a, a lovely word um, that they have in Ireland, which means, uh, in Irish, which I can't pronounce, but it means um, homefulness. Ooh. It is just that sense of, um, well, in Welsh, in Welsh it's hilaith, isn't it? That longing for home, even if yes. you've never been there. Um, I don't know what it is in German. But you have, have it. To, I'd have to build it. But you have it in German. Yes. I like that. So did you de develop a facility? Did you? Were you a, were you a prodigy? Did you? I mean, did no. you, you didn't pick languages up like sort of. I, I, I mean, I think I would have been known at school as definitely not someone who sat head and shoulders above the rest. I was oh, really? just a swat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and you also. derived genuine pleasure from doing it. It wasn't I just it. collecting results. You loved the actual no the process. means the process of yeah. it. Yeah. As and well. we would get home from school, uh, my sister and I, and um, we had this incredibly um, unwelcoming, unhomely study with really hard chairs, which I'd kneel upon. And I've always been really skinny, so that hurt. <laughs> it was freezing cold because my dad didn't believe in heating. <laughs> and um, But that's where I wanted to be. And I would sit there kneeling and just lose myself in my books. I loved homework. I mean, I really am... The absolute archetypal nerd, I'm you, afraid. Did you watch telly? Yeah, we watched telly, but we did that whole family thing, you right, know. Yes. So, um, yeah, Morecambe and Wise, all the classics. Ask the family, um, Starsky and Hutch, remember that? I do, yes, yeah. it's a brilliant programme. So I, se I sense there wasn't a lot of rebellion, Susie. <laughs> um, no, there was very little rebellion, but there was a lot of solitude. Okay. Uh, so it was my own kind of rebellion. Like, I would just... Um, I just didn't, I really didn't give a damn. I would just get my car, uh, my car, my bike, <laughs> um, pack it with little ice pops and little sort of snacks mm. and, and just head off. Uh, and I, you know, I had that freedom, which was, which was brilliant. So I think that was my, you know, and you were happy what everyone else was doing. I was happy. I mean, I had, I think I did have the usual friendship woes. Sure. You know, and I've always, always wanted to belong to some sort of huge 
very tightly knit friendship group where everyone just you know mm. is, they're there all the time but um not for me it was always kind of you know ones and twos yes really. yeah, yeah so proper bonds rather than yeah group bonds yeah but no tribe did you find your tribe when you got to oxford did you sort of my tribe um no really i struggled when i went to oxford in my first first term for sure i just had no idea where i fitted in um and uh was often alone on a saturday night but again Mm. i just was losing myself in music i put the blind down because it was a bit like celebrity squares everyone could see where you were because it was (laughs) these big glass fish bowls um (laughs) roger to call your nookie just (laughs) next door (laughs) there you go Uh, and uh but even then it wasn't i wasn't I think I got whipped up in my own sort of romantic melancholy. You know, I was one of those people. And and then I found my feet. I, I um, decided I would join the kind of drama bit. So yes. I, was, I was just a stage manager. I wasn't doing anything glamorous. And um, and found my feet. And then I discovered parties and boys. So it was all Lovely. okay. Yeah, which, and, and was it a relatively easy journey into Oxford? Did you, I mean, was it presumed you would go there? No, in not at all. So n- none of my family have been to university. Well, my sister went, but neither of my parents or grandparents or anything. Um, and I genuinely chose the college that I went to, which I love now, mm. uh, Somerville, because it sounded like an American ice cream parlour. Mm. I mean, it was not like it is now where you, you know, you forensically examine which college you want to go to. I literally just thought, that sounds nice. Um, and because it was German and I think because um, it's not a madly competitive subject, um, yeah, I got in. And at my interview, my lovely tutor, who was already in her 70s, I think, offered me a glass of sherry. It was one of those. Very nice. Yeah. Um, are you a big reader? Were you a big reader then, outside yeah. of your studies? Did you sort of yes, enjoy I fiction? Yes, I loved or? reading um, and would find, given the freezing house, I would find the only bit of sun that I could um, uh, squeeze into, which was usually by one particular window. And again, I'd kneel on the floor with, with my sort of bum and the just very, very very weird postures and, and I would just just read yeah. what were your favourites um, I went through the whole pony thing like everyone else um, yeah I think it was all the classics it was um, Secret Princess it was um, hmm. Tom's Midnight Garden it was you know all of those so when you get to university and you've mm. got you, you, you're very lucky in a sense to have discovered something about which you are so passionate, a sort of a, a German, a subject that yeah. speaks to you in ways that very few people encounter in, in the world of academia. Did you have any sense of the future? If I'd met you in the sixth form or at Oxford and I said, what do you want to do when you graduate? What would you have said? Um, if you'd got me in, um, well, maybe two or three years before sixth form, I would have said a hotel manager because okay. I was obsessed with hotels uh whenever we went on holiday which is not that often actually i thought i just wanted to stay in the hotel right. um because it was warm probably because the heating warm. was warm. i loved all the gadgety things yes. and i loved like all the little you know if we ever went on a plane i'd collect yeah. all those little salt and pepper pots i i don't think i'm abnormal I no not at all for doing that uh but then in sixth form um no, I don't think I would have had a clue and that actually remained so when i got to the end of my first degree I had no clue what I wanted to do so I decided I'd go to America because I'd always wanted to see New York and I thought that's what I'm going to do so I applied to a few US universities. And and you went to Princeton? Yeah. Which is a very big deal. It was a big deal Um, but again and I'm not I know this sounds like uh, horribly false modesty and I I really don't mean it to be but German is because it's not the most sought after subject it it is much um, less difficult I think um, to get places there's fewer people chasing a decent number of places exactly Um, and it actually came down to a choice between Princeton and um, Santa Barbara which was part of um, UCLA and I checked out Santa Barbara I didn't go to Santa Barbara but I just I I wore a lot of black at that point I wore uh, (laughs) big hooped earrings and you know I had lots of freckles I just thought I'm not I know Santa Barbara is going to be surfer stuff yes. and that's just not me so east coast was it could be a sliding obvious. doors moment this you could, you could, you could have <laughs> gone full done. baywatch if you I, come I, to. I absolutely could have done. um but i would have just been you know burnt red and um and did you have a lovely time at Princeton? did you have a, an amazing time i did have a really good time um again it was a good just it was all about finding such a you know a nice nice circle of friends um and yeah i loved it and i totally milked the fact that my accent was 
that even, you know back there was mm. considered quite exotic um w- graduates were regarded as being very geeky uh and it's all modeled on oxford it's weird it's kind of like a sort of hollywood oxford but very beautiful and then i went to live in new york um and commuted into princeton so that was good my boyfriend at the time had a job there in manhattan and so yeah that was the obvious place to be so that was that was great um no no stress on leaving home then it's the kind of being away from home it seems as if i didn't really get um that homesick which looking back i find quite extraordinary i was um lonely sometimes but not in a sense where i thought i have to get you know i have to get back um and I remember arriving at Princeton, having missed the shuttle bus, well, arriving at JFK um, in New York, missing the shuttle bus and having, because it was snowing and having mm. to spend the night at the airport. And even then, I don't have a sense where I felt worried or anxious, which given the anxious me now, I find right. quite extraordinary. But no, it's just... Was it because you're so comfortable in your own company? That, that just Maybe, but plus there was this, as I say, this narrative in my head. So yes. I probably sort of shifted it a little bit. And I feel I've slightly lost touch with that. I'd like to do that now because it's a great coping mechanism. Of course. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's quite therapeutic, isn't it? I mean, it it, is. literally, in terms of therapy, it's quite a, yeah. a, a self care, I suppose. I suppose it's self care. Yeah. And you do have the power to to change things mm. up there if you want to. Um, so a master's now in, in German and a, and a degree, an undergraduate degree in German. So the obvious path would be academia, wouldn't it? Yeah, um, but not for me. I just, I'm a very restless person, James, and I, my family get ex- really um, irritated with me because I'm not very good at sitting down for very long. <laughs> and I just didn't have the stamina for academia. I, I just, I did my dissertation for the MA and um, I thought that's that's it. Um, the, the rest of it isn't for me. But I did stay on and I taught uh, freshmen um, men and women, fresh men and women, uh, <laughs> German uh, for a year, which was fabulous. So I did, um, I did an extra year there, and then came back. So your teaching wasn't going to float your boat either. For no, I did time. really love teaching actually, but um, no, I did really consider staying in the US, but there was a whole visa problem. Okay, and then uh, decided I would come back to London. And take my chances there. Yeah. So the decision was taken for you in a way then with visas well, and I stuff suppose, like yeah, that. That's true. So. That's true. But I didn't really think about teaching when I came back. Do you sound there's a strange you, you sound quite fearless. You probably don't think of yourself as that. I don't Looking know. Looking back, I think I probably yeah, was, yeah. yeah. Um and I can't really ex- explain that. But <laughs> um but I, I really don't consider myself to be fearless now right. at all. Um I feel I, I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm a sort of angsty person. I don't. I don't live in angst, but I, my glass is definitely becoming half empty. <laughs> old <laughs> <as I> get. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I. I think I probably was. It was. It was difficult moving back. Right. Uh, and I did feel that everyone else had sort of got their, you know, their lives sorted, and I had mm. absolutely no clue what to do. And I moved to Soho, so I was living in the middle. Uh, which I loved, but I didn't have any money to go out and spend it in Soho. And then I got the job at Oxford University Press and commuted because I wasn't going to leave Soho. To Oxford. The, Whereabouts in Soho were you? Uh, Broadwick Street. Good grief, so, really? So, yeah, I was right. There's a lovely news agent that looks down onto Berwick yeah, yeah, Street yeah. and um, I was right above, above that. Above that? Yeah. That's mad, yeah, isn't it? it? I, could, to think that you could live with no money in the heart of Soho. Well, it was fair rented so it was yes, part of the kind of, of Westminster Council fair right. rent scheme and so I was yeah, incredibly lucky we did get quite a few passes by as you would imagine ringing on the doorbell asking for other things Yes, uh, but it was other than that probably one of the safest places I've ever felt yeah I can, I can believe that because you're, cause you're in the smack in the middle of people all the time exactly you, so. yeah and Oxford Street wasn't open in those days so Sundays belonged to mm. the real the the residents. residents yeah it was lovely um, so did, where did the job come from? Did you apply for it? Was it in the back yeah, of the Guardian? Was it where was it? Was it? Um, yeah, I, it was one of those. Um, I mean, I did. I had au pair um, off and on as well to earn some money, and um, for some reason, I always remember getting those jobs from the lady. Do you remember yes, the lady? Yes, magazine? of course. Yeah. Uh, but no, I think it probably was the Guardian or similar, and uh, it was probably. 15th 20th job that I'd applied for. Okay, so uh, um, and and this was to work initially on. Bilingual, Bilingual. Diction- dictionaries. Yes. So we've t- not touched yet. So where are we now? Mid twenties. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so, uh, what was I, 23, 24, I think, yeah. Okay, and yet we haven't heard anything about the enthusiasm for, 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 for English words yet, have we? Was no. It, was it not in place? Did it not uh, no, flower? Other than liking a bit of writing for the school magazine, mm. um, no, it wasn't in place at all. It was always French and German at this point. Okay. Mm. So you get you get to the um, Oxford University Press and you start working on dictionaries. What does that involve? Cause, yeah, well, you good point. Yeah. Well, I was, um, on th- at this point, I was mostly on the uh, commissioning side. So I was less on the compilation side and much more on the well I was an editorial assistant I was right. on 13 grand I think a year and I was in charge of reprints and making sure corrections went in um, so quite clerical jackets is it or- uh I suppose it was admin, but yeah. I still had a sense that I was involved in the content, and yes. you would get re- you would get experts commenting on the text and that kind of thing. So it wasn't okay. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't all external, but um, yeah, it was it was fun. And and as you say, English came the English dictionary side came a lot later. Did, so did you have a sense of coming home when you started working with dictionaries in the same way that you did when you started learning German? No, I don't no. think it was a sense of coming home. Um, I still. Felt I was slightly on the periphery, so I was commuting back to Soho. It was at that point a lovely job, but it wasn't my world at all. Right. Um, and yeah, I was still having fun. I was still seeing friends, partying. I, I was so I, I I did go through a stage where I was quite normal, <laughs> um, and then and then discovered uh, English word origins, which was what got me really fired up. It did it? Was, yeah. It was almost um, straight away as soon as you started looking yes, into stuff. I looked at uh, there's a, a quite an old dictionary of um, English etymology by someone called Walter Skeet, and mm. I remember just getting lost in that really and thinking, wow, this is actually I've never thought about this. Um, so that was a bit of a light bulb moment, as they say, for me. Because um, it's like archaeology, is it? What is it? What it is. is. It's exactly like linguistic archaeology or word detection or whatever. In fact, detectives and lexicographers share much of the same vocabulary because we're looking oh, for clues and yeah. we're looking for evidence, um, earliest records of things, and you're just sifting constantly, um, which is which is brilliant. And that's the side that really appeals. Yeah. Um, and so I became less interested, I suppose, in the mechanics of it all and much more interested in the content. So that's quite serendipitous then, isn't it, really, that that, that you were in the right place? At the right time. To stumble For into sure. this area of yeah. later passion? I know, and I may not have ever discovered sure. it, really. So, you know, I could be working on, I don't know, translating German technical manuals or something. Uh, so, <laughs> and, and uh, I mean, the employer accommodated this. It was, it was a, a you couldn't, there was a bit of fluidity to your... Yeah, work. it's, well, working in the, in the dictionary team, there's, there's quite a lot of overlap between um, the commissioning editorial side and the actual hands-on lexicographical side. Uh, so I loved working closely with the lexicographers um, it's still an area that fascinates me, and particularly now, course, dictionary is mostly online, so the physical books are hardly ever reprinted. Mm. Um, which is why I use a laptop on Countdown, even though people think that I am constantly looking at an anagram finder or whatever. <laughs> I'm just looking at the dictionary. Is there, is there any sense of loss there? Because when you first started, you flicked through the pages, didn't you, with your special camera pen thing? Had a pen cam, the, yeah. and I was quite a good dictionary flicker. Um, so yes there is but then I use that on Comedy Countdown on the yes. 8 10 Cats and it's really frustrating because I know that there is a word in there yeah. that isn't in there if you know what I mean there's yes, a word in the language that is not in the dictionary because the dictionary hasn't been reprinted for ages yes so um, yes of course so now I now I've got used to it so how, how does it I mean th- this then you thought presumably this is me set up now for for life or at least career wise this is what I'm going to carry on doing because there's no we're never going to run out of words no (laughs) never run out of words and um OUP is a really special place actually Mm. um and it's it felt like the sort of place where you could stay and you could things would change and you would um you know yeah so definitely for the foreseeable that was where I was going to be um and of course, I eventually moved to Oxford as well. And then, uh, yeah, as you know, the countdown thing was completely 
Well, so this is 1992. 1992. Can you remember? I mean, it, 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 you clearly didn't have any particular desire to be on telly or to be famous. I don't think no. you've got a show off gene particularly, have no, you? Quite the opposite, not. perhaps, in fact. Yeah. So someone that comes into your office and says, I don't suppose you fancy doing this weird television thing, do you, Susie? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my boss, Simon, um, so, he a very deep voice and he said yes we, we have this arrangement with a program called Countdown which I had seen right um, of course and he said um, they really they really need people to go up <laughs> and there were lots of different I have to stress this it was a big team yes. you know so um, I turned it down again and again because it just was it just absolutely wasn't something I thought I could do and uh, eventually Simon persuaded me um basically by saying it was going to be part of my job yes. so I went and yeah I do remember it really well actually and unfortunately so do many other people because it's up on YouTube um, and I rigidly <laughs> rigid backed and just staring at Rila Lenska and Richard and Carol um, and yeah I don't know honestly I really wasn't particularly good at all they were far more expert people there so I rotated it only went up once or twice a year H how many people were rotating originally um, probably six or seven. Oh, really yeah, and yeah. they were all colleagues at OUP yeah, were they they were all at OUP was there any competitiveness yeah. no no um, no I don't think so at least I didn't notice it because I definitely wouldn't have been competing for more slots. I enjoy. I definitely enjoyed it, uh, but it was nice to stay in a hotel. Yes. Stuck in the hotel, of bit. course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, collecting my my little mini bar thing. But no, I don't. It wasn't. You know, again, it wasn't the career path that I was looking at. So it was so just an, a little a a added nice bonus on top yeah, of a yeah, job yeah. that you that you knew that you loved. Yeah. Did the other did Carol rotate as well? There no. Was a, there was well, a very the, very beginning because she was here not long ago, and I I, oh, I don't she, remember yeah. these bits of countdown. She's, she's amazing. I mean, she's lovely. Clips of her. Yes. So um, no, she was there from the start, but there was another. I think yeah, from no, the very first right. program, but there yes. was another um, person as well. Uh, who I never met actually, and they did it together, and then eventually it was just Richard and Carol. And yeah, narrowed down, and then it narrowed yeah. down in Dictionary Corner as well. How did that happen? Yes, that happened because lovely Richard and Carol decided they wanted a full time team, and um, and I just happened to be in the right place, right time. No, they, I mean, they well, had a lot of choices they could have made, and they obviously wanted you. Uh, yeah, but but um, your producers were looking over and smiling here. But um, <laughs> yeah, of course, that's true. I mean, I wasn't terrible. I think the one thing that I was okay at doing was predicting what the contestants would come up with. So okay. I would look up in those 30 seconds right. something that may or may not be there. Um, Which makes so everyone's experience the more... Fl I mean, it's quicker, actually. It's quicker. So yeah. from Richard's point of view, certainly, I sense he probably... Didn't want to be. Liked that. Didn't want to be sitting around. <laughs> could, have been, could have been in the oh, green room. <laughs> amazing, Richard. I mean, Carol probably said he could be as grumpy as hell, but yes. in a really honest way. Yes. So you absolutely knew where you stood um, with him. Yes. Not unlike Sean Locke, actually. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who, yeah. If he was grumpy, you knew he was grumpy, but it was quite disarming because he didn't try and hide it. But it, it wasn't aggressive either. It was just a sort of harumphness. And, and a consummate broadcaster, of course. I mean, Richard. Yes. Incredible. I mean, he interviewed every prime minister i think bar carol wilson i think right. in his lifetime so i think people forgot that because he hid behind the puns and the ties didn't mm. he but actually he was yeah he had a, he had a very good brain except in yorkshire because everyone in yorkshire would know him very differently from the rest of the country wouldn't they okay. because of calendar and and so there he true. was part of the current affairs furniture but for the yeah. rest of the country That's he was very true. He was Mr. Countdown. He was. And, and did, what did you enjoy about it then? Because from everything you've told us so far, <laughs> you had no business enjoying being on the <laughs> telly. <laughs> uh, no. I uh, Well, first of all, I my focus was kind of elsewhere in my life and at home in mm. London and whatever. So it wasn't something that, obviously... I took the job seriously, but I didn't. I didn't really overthink it. Okay. Uh, and I get, yeah, you know, it's literally the best seat in the house because I get to sit next to amazing people. Mm. Um, so I love that aspect of it, and it's just it, it's just a lovely team. Which, um, well, you know, because you've been up there, but mm. many of them have been working on the program for as long as me, almost. So you know, they they genuinely are a second family. But what what about the actual? 
relationship with the camera with the television did you mm. enjoy being on tv did you? didn't yeah it or was did you not think of it like i didn't that? really think a bit about it i still don't massively no. um when people say they've watched me on something it kind of brings me up short because i tend to imagine lots of sort of anonymous yes people um and yeah i feel actually it's interesting i feel more nervous doing this than i think i ever would um, on countdown because I know this will go out on social media yeah and there's something about social me social media compared with TV that I think is much more exposing Isn't yeah that strange no um, it's not strange it's I guess it's because you immediately then get the feedback don't you well it's it much more interactive I suppose you. but I think no, you'll be all right I don't think you've got anything particularly <laughs> to worry about did when did people start recognizing you in the street and stuff um here and there, I suppose, after I went full time on Countdown, but it was there was a massive difference after eight out of ten cats just countdown. Was hugely, it hugely? Yeah, because okay. it's prime time. Yeah, Friday night, and yeah, I've really re re noticed the difference. Uh, as have my kids actually. So they'll often say they recognised you or they're talking about you, and blissfully, James, I don't notice. That's nice. Um, I really don't, and I don't think it's because my radar's off. I. I just, for some reason, don't pick up the signals that they do. They're much more attuned to those. When did that um, start? What year did it start? 8 out of 10 cats. 8 out of 10 cats, gosh, we've done about 200 shows now. So we've been doing it for about, uh, well, maybe 10 years, actually. And Long you time. love it. I mean, the you have so much fun. It's it's yeah. it's, 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 it's palpable. Do. No, oh, you, personally. I mean, oh, you, you personally. you personally. Because they do that I'm all the time. That. They, 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 that's what they all do. That's what they do. But you, you, you have so much fun doing I d it. I'm glad you say that because I think I am, certainly in the early days, I think I was edited to look as if I was slightly looking down on everybody, right. all, the, all the kind of silly boys, you know. Um, <laughs> and so they wouldn't cut to me laughing very often. They'd, they'd sort of, you know, catch me doing an eye roll or something. But uh, but I'm glad you said that because I do laugh mm. a lot and um, I never really uh, was into stand up before actually. So what's quite nice is that the comedians are quite new to me, um, okay. and and so I feel like I'm sort of entering a world that I didn't really know before. Did you so bite their arm off when they came to you with it, or did you think that's a very strange suggestion for a television program? Um, no, it, I thought this is going to be fun because it was part of a mash up evening uh, where. Channel 4 put lots yeah. of different people in lots of different things. So Rachel and I were on um, Deal or No Deal, uh, for example. And so for the very first one, I think I was okay. I, I was I didn't have a clue what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> but then when it became more of an official thing, that's when I started getting worried because they're all funny. Uh, there is, for anyone sitting in the audience, they will know that there's about an hour before they get to introduce me and the comedian next to me because you have loads of comedy you have about five questions for each guest comedian mm. uh you have their mascots uh which takes a long time and then finally they will get to us by which point they would have had an hour the audience Gosh. of full-on belly laughs mm. and then jimmy will say Susie, we've got an american on the show tonight um what's your favorite american word and i think <laughs> not only do i have to think of an american word it has to be funny and i tried really hard and um spectacularly failed I mean there's no you know comedy is so much about expectation if you expect someone to be funny doesn't matter what they say mm. you, you know it, it you will laugh mm. um and I I noticed that with um actually particularly with Sean he would go to open his mouth and then kind of sit back and people would fall about laughing I just think how can you get a laugh out of that yeah. it's because people expect him to be funny and with me, it was the opposite. <laughs> um, so Rachel and I noticed this sort of, you know, this peak of laughter, and then they come to us, and it's just this kind of nervous ha. <laughs> um, so now I, I totally know I am Jimmy Stooge. I will, if I'm lucky to get some sort of revenge bar bin, I will. <laughs> but other than that, I will just take his accusations that my books are a form of euthanasia, or you know, any of that stuff, and. And that's what I'm there for. You've been lucky with colleagues, haven't you, as well? Really? Oh, I, on the show? Yeah. Or just generally? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the ones that people know about. Yeah. I, I mean, because you speak with great warmth about Richard and Karen yeah. and Rachel and Jimmy and, and, and yeah. Sean. Yeah, no, I have been uh, incredibly lucky, actually. And people always say, which, who's your favourite Countdown host? And my boring answer is that they were all really, really different. I, I love Des Lynham because he was 
he, I don't think he particularly enjoyed the job. <laughs> um, but he was just so... He's so funny off camera right, as well yes. as on. Um, Jimmy is funny yet unscripted, I think. Okay. His, his, I have Apart from Lee Mack, I don't think I've ever met anyone who is so quick. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's literally instantaneous, and I, I just find that astonishing mm. um, in terms of finding the right retort or, or joke. Uh, so... Yeah, and, I, and um, Rach and I get on really well. Um, so, no, I have been really lucky. And so how, how is the, 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 the fascination with words developing alongside the television career then? How, how are you? Because for a while, did you do both jobs? Did, or, or once yeah, so you I went... did both jobs um, for, yeah, quite a few years, actually. So most, most of the time in the early days when I was on Countdown, I was, my main job was working yeah. on the dictionaries. Um, and then I went full time in about 2003, 2004, I think. Mm. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so then I gave up the dictionary work. Was that hard? Was it, or, or, or did the decision take itself, really? Did it? it actually did almost make uh, itself, the decision made itself, mm. because um, I had a daughter at that point who didn't particularly like me going to work every day mm. and I thought this way I would actually be at home a little bit more um, and and you know and it was it was something different and exciting and so actually no I think it did come back at the right time uh, and then because yeah because I um, I had my daughter I just I didn't really do huge amounts of other things um, I did do a series of books for OUP called Language Reports mm. which were looking at changes that year to the language which I loved but it always used to make the papers as well didn't it be a, it did the, because it was always the, yeah, the, the new, new words mm. new pronunciations that kind of thing uh, and then it's only really in the last decade I would say that I've really pumped up the sort of other stuff and now as you mentioned I do podcasts and that kind of thing mm. um, did you so did you um, I mean it sounds quite organic really it sounds as if you've kind of settled into doing things that you enjoy was there must yeah. have been a period which probably coincided with you not wanting to do more because of your family situation but yeah. there must have been a period where you were being offered quite odd jobs like tv wise and um i'm sure there were uh, friends of mine who i was at school with who uh, i've not been in touch with for decades and they must switch on the telly and think oh my god she's still there <laughs> <laughs> poor thing she's not found anything else let her out <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i'm sure she really wanted to, to move on to other things uh but uh no not really uh i think because what i do is so specialized that as i say up until probably the last five six years yeah. um no, I don't. I, I definitely didn't get um, lots of telly offers or anything like that. But, but just, and this is what I love about my job, actually, is that I and I think you are the same. Um, and your job is incredibly meaty, anyway. But I don't. I want to be known for what I do. Mm. So um, you know, I, I would not want to be on on so-called celebrity shows just sure. because I'm on telly mm. it, uh, so my association with words I hope I've kept that yes and that is what I want to be known for um and now it's just yeah I mean also I think the interest in language has exploded so I do get offered to talk on the radio and um a bit of telly and that kind of thing because there is that passion about language why do you think it's exploded why do you think that's exploded um I think there are more reminders out there now about why language matters. Uh, and I think there's obviously, um, it's obvious, there are far more platforms uh, for us mm. to discuss language upon. Uh, and I think also, I like to think that politically people have become a little bit savvier about reading between the lines, but mm. then that's quite patronising to our parents and grandparents who I'm sure also realised agendas and euphemisms and things. Maybe. But there's much, there seems to be much more kind of analysis, but also I think there's a thirst for escape. And I think people, certainly when I dredge up a word from the historical dictionary that seems so appropriate for today, you get that. I think people marvel at the fact that it existed mm. in another time. Um, there obviously was a need for it then, but also a, a intrigued as I am as to why it kind of languished for so long. And then, you know, today's word is quite a good example of that, isn't it? Oh yeah, I did that sitting on this chair actually did before you? you came. Yeah, ruthful, ruthful. Um, I just love it. Yeah, because 
uh, I always bang on about this, but there are so many lost positives yes. um, in the dictionary and we focus entirely on the negative. So Ruthful is to be full of compassion. The name Ruth means compassionate. And Ruthful was around in the 13th century. And to be fair, Ruthless was only a century later, about okay. 100 years. Yeah. Um, and Ruthful just died a death, really. What? What? How do you study that then? How do you? How do you explore the reasons why it died a death? Because it's a lovely word, and it should. I mean, it's all beautiful. three. Ruth itself should be in more. You could describe a politician as being markedly lacking in Ruth, couldn't you? Well, <laughs> this possibly. Is, that was what prompted this. Um, but. Yes, you could. And actually, what's also really interesting about human nature is that the only way that Ruthful has survived is in Rueful, oh, because yes. Rue is a kind of um, riff on Ruth. Right. So even Rueful, to be Ruthful is to be sort of slightly re kind of regretful, mm, isn't it? And, mm, and mm. remorseful almost. Um, so it's lost its positivity again. Uh, and I love the fact that, for example, soon in Old English meant now, right. immediately. Yes. But because of the way that we are, it kind of meant, well, at some point, yes. we'll do it. It's yes. a bit like yes. The, yes. Yes. in Devon, yes. they have directly. Yes. I'll do it directly, which is not directly at all. It's like manana, I'll do it at some point, yeah. uh, which which I like. And so you can you get a sense of uh, human nature, I think, by the way that these words develop, obviously. So uh, it's a fascination so. with humans, actually, well, and, course, and, yeah. and why they do the things they do, yeah, and words yeah. being, I mean, obviously, the, the key mode of communication yeah how, how does the academic side of it work though when you come like how do you can you tell do you do you work out why ruthful fell out of use or, or, or is it just attrition really um well i think there's all sorts of things going on so for example um if you were to say to me why is shakespeare the most quoted author in the oed you'd have to look back at the way dictionaries were compiled you'd have to look back at the sort of literary canon that was studied for um, proper quotations. Yeah. You know, Samuel Johnson only wanted to look at the classics. He didn't want any of the kind of vulgar mm. language on the street. He changed his mind. But um, And the OED um, found so many um, brilliant records of words from Shakespeare that they put those in at the expense, I'm sure, quite often of people who were using those words before. Yeah. Um, so it's partly the way that dictionaries have been compiled, I think. And... Um, and, and what dictionary compilers were looking for, but also um, that it does must say something about our dwelling on the sort of, you know, slightly bad and sad side of lives. Because mm. we are, I think a lot of it also has to do with um, the fact that when we sit around and gossip, we are probably quite negative and take the mickey out of people because yes. dialect also collects around certain themes and they tend to be earthy, um, quite bitchy themes so yeah. you know yeah bow legged bow, being bow legged or bandy legged there's loads of words in the dialect dictionary for that um so many more words for being cold starving ugly blisters and armpits all of those stuff get a lot of mentions whereas the sort of more poetic and literary side of things they just don't really get a look because in. you don't close the door with a friend and a confidant and then start saying nice things about people no. who aren't there very often exactly do you? and that's that's very sad and you can see that on all the reality tv of shows course you, can. you can just see yes. it on all the social media stuff that comes out so i think that's probably why but it always kills me that there are words in the dictionary that are so utterly exquisite mm. and yet there's only one record of it. That's incredible. Um, but there is also, of course, solace in the fact that it is there in the first place and that it won't ever go because when it comes to the Oxford English Dictionary, if a word's in, it will never come out. So that brings us rather neatly to the, because you've got two books out imminently, one for children and yeah. one not necessarily for children, although children would, would of a certain age would love it. So Roots of Happiness is your attempt to sort of inject a few address more happy the words yes into yeah, the, into the, into the yes. national vocabulary yes i would i would uh, absolutely love to do that so yes it's bringing back some of the lost positives but it's also dwelling on words that just make me smile um or that sound gorgeous or that have a lovely story to them uh, and just oh, i mean i have to say also that it's i i feel a bit of an imposter always sitting here talking about this book because so much of the glory is down to the illustrations um, by Harriet Ogde because they are they are just gorgeous. 
Um, yes, but it works as a as a volume, doesn't it? They were, you couldn't have one without the other. No, well, I, no, that is true. But um, but Aurora, yeah, Aurora, Aurora is Aurora. A wonderful. It's just isn't gorgeous, it? isn't it? <laughs> and love light. Yes. So you see just the the love light in someone's eyes and um, daddle dum do, which is me. That's an old dialect word for a daydreamer. You're such a daddle dum do. Um, and there's silly ones in there like a snottinger for a hanky handkerchief. Um, chortle and giggle mug and it's glorious. Yeah. I'm not very mat- matutinal. I'm not very matutinal either, um, but some people are, in which case yes. they're also a giggle mug. So matutinal is to be bright and cheery in the morning, and to be a giggle mug is to be constantly smiling, which, depending on your point of view, can either make or break your day. Yes. Um, but yes, I am a hum gruffin, probably like you first thing in the morning. But I didn't put that in because it's not a happy word. No, and and they all they are all <laughs> happy words. How do you how do you? I mean, what, what did you do? Did you did you start with a thousand and whittle it down to a hundred, or did you start no. with none and work your way up to a hundred? Uh, <laughs> no, I just because I've been on a mission for such a long time. I honestly was sitting on a train and I just had the notes app out on my phone. I was just. They just poured, poured, genuinely poured out because That's lovely. they're all my favourites. So I, I'm sure I would have missed out loads that I should have put in. Well, I, I mean, it's your Next book. You can do, yes, yeah. exactly. A hundred more words to, <laughs> for joy and hope. So some, some of them are words that people will know. Some of them are words yeah. that people won't know. And some of the words are, 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 are that you sort of think you should know, like respair. Yes, one record. That's a really good example. One record only of despair from the 17th century, opposite of despair. It should be everywhere. We need despair more than ever. (laughs) You know, I tweet this one every single New Year's Eve. Yes. Um, I think it's just bloody time now for some despair. And everyone says, oh, yes, yes, bring it on. Next year it's exactly the same. Isn't it time yet? Not catching on. I might add it to my business card. I'm a (laughs) despair. Good. If you're an optimist, I like to think you're a despair as well. Um, And so. Uh, you're trying this is aimed I mean to be fair everyone's going to enjoy it regardless of their age partly because it's words and everyone enjoys words regardless of their age I think of you reading shampoo bottles there'll be children who will read this book with a similar sense of sort of wonder and 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 transportation as well You, you you'd get taken to places by words don't you yeah I'm glad you used that word because um it's, I do a theatre show sometimes and I often get, because yeah, I do this whole bit about American English and mm. how I absolutely love it and people say, well what about all these words like transportation, why can't transport do? But actually that was ours, 16th century, <laughs> so it's been around for ages um, but yeah, it does take you to other worlds and especially when they come with pictures as well, you can um, yeah, that, I think that's the whole idea, like I'm just looking here it's a clinker bell, it's yeah. an icicle and that just immediately takes you somewhere so how do you find them? So what 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 do you read in your in your downtime as 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 it were that allows you to stumble across words that are not in general usage anymore? Um well I do generally have the OED open usually on my phone or on my computer every day not mm. not the Have you finished it and started no. again? No there is but somebody did <laughs> Amon Shea um read the entire OED from start to finish he's written a book about it and he started to get the worst headaches in yeah. the world I yeah. mean he really suffered with this uh, but he did it which is great uh, so I don't have to do it <laughs> um, but uh, yeah so I'm constantly reading that and it's also got this fantastic historical thesaurus element now so you can click on um a word uh for for example corrupt Mm. and (laughs) you can then look in historical thesaurus and you will see all the words for corrupt throughout the ages um that have been recorded in the oed i mean it's just amazing you just dive in and not come out again so i read that there's also uh i read dialect glossaries and um where do they come? But Where do you find dialect? Yeah, people give them to me quite often, right. which is lovely. And these would be old volumes. That, yeah, they that, are quite old. Okay. Um, the English Dialect Dictionary is online. That's amazing. That was done by someone called Joseph Wright, who was like he made a really concerted effort to collect regional vocabulary, which is often left out of dictionaries because mm. it's such a spoken tradition. Um, and now the University of Leeds actually are starting up again, which is brilliant. So they have um, people who uh, go many different households and they say what do you call being hungry mm. or what if you're tired what do you call that and they make a note of it and then they can map it out it's social it. history isn't it it really? is yeah. it's fantastic um, and there's real efforts going on as well to capture 
lost languages, not ones that are going, not just ones that are becoming extinct worldwide, but things like Pitmatic, the language of mining in Northumberland, Northumberland and the language of lost industries. Um, British Library is doing quite a lot on that front too. So it's low, there's a lot going on um, attempting to preserve language as well as kind of, you know, watch its evolution. So it's a good example then of uh, it'd be easy to get a little bit nostalgic about the, the, the demise of the big paper dictionary but actually the world the world of lexicography and etymology has yeah. expanded exponentially because of technology. Exactly and we've always been scared of technology we've always thought it's going to bring English down mm. and um, particularly you know well we've had telegrams we've had postcards for the Victorians they were worried about those but now we have the internet, uh, which caused a lot of fear, and I think there is a general perception that English is going to the dogs. Uh, but you know what? That's been around forever. Yeah. Uh, there's never been a golden age. So um, it has expanded things. And, and I mentioned regional dialect, and that is just one example, because um, people are swapping stories is what, they, you know, what their parents said, what their grandparents said. They're starting to reuse them in kind of mashed up sort of ways. And it's being written down, and that's what dictionary publishers rely on, which yeah, is amazing. Of course. How yeah. do I mean? And, and, and you pick. I mean, the, the the book you've done for adults is is similar in a way, isn't it? It's the stories behind curious words and, yes. and phrases. It's a it's it's a bit a bit brewerish, is it? A bit. bit, bit it's like... definitely. I so um, I have to uh, give full hat tip to Ebenezer Cobham Brewer because Ebenezer Cobham Brewer. What a great, great name! Great. <laughs> so he was the um, the Reverend Brewer, yes. who essentially. I, I feel like it, I'm, I'm definitely in either on his shoulders or in his shadow. I'm not sure, but he had the same mo as me, yeah. which is that he went around with notebooks and just scribbled anything down that, that took his fancy, and then came up with the the reference book to be all reference books called Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. So yeah, it's heavily reliant on that. But, uh, but um, it, I mean, I, I meant that in a perfectly good way. Oh no, I'm so, really yeah. happy to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's a brilliant thing. But his is, I think it was Philip Pullman who was an editor of um, one of the editions. It's now in its 19th. Was and I did, did the last one, yeah. I didn't know that. And he said it is, and there was also Terry Pratchett, actually it may have been Terry Pratchett who said this, um, that the text kind of draws you in and it says to you, this isn't in fact what you're looking for, but it's much more interesting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, and I love that. About but you've got, you've got that as well, I think. I mean, yeah, I, th I think I have. I just think, oh, actually, yeah, this is not what I came for. What did I come for? This is interesting. Yeah. And but it's called really Interesting Stories About word, about Curious, curious words, words, and it's an absolute joy. It's, oh. it's And you've covered it, I, I mean, it's so much ground, haven't you? Not just in these two new books, but um, the, 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 the fascination, as you've just touched upon, with regional... Yeah. Variations from Cockney to Geordie, a national companion. That was um, how to talk like a local. Yeah. The, the, Badly named that book. Do I you think. think so? Yeah, because uh, I actually looking back, it it really wasn't telling people how to talk. Like, right. It was it was just more of a um, a glossary of some of the most beautiful words I think for, and, and funny words from different dialects. But um, but it was fun to research. How does it happen? How, how do you end up with people who live 20 miles apart having a different word for the same thing? Yeah, it's extraordinary. Uh, yeah, it's a dialect changes that quickly. If you if you take a subject like a bread roll yeah. and map it out, you can see how quickly it changes. Um, and I, I, I actually, can I tell you how it happens? Um, I can tell you that when Shakespeare was alive um, and before, I, well, actually, it wasn't before, but it was really English printing that standardised spelling. Before then, it was utterly chaotic. Yeah, and it was a free-for-all. It was a free-for-all yeah. in a most glorious way. And, <laughs> and dialect also was absolutely everywhere because people stayed within their communities, essentially. They didn't really need to disseminate anything far and wide. And... Um, it's, uh, and that was kind of celebrated, really. But it's only now that I feel like we're returning to that in broadcasting. We welcome um, regional voices in yes. a way that obviously it was tried. The people tried to erase it famously um, with BBC English, etc. Um, so there, so there was huge regional diversity in the past. Why it was only twenty miles, I'm not sure, but I guess there were the very, very small communities that mm. then develop their own vocabulary and I always feel I don't know about you but I always feel a bit of a cop out because when people say oh what do you call an alleyway what do you call the bread rolls and I just go roll yeah. alleyway <laughs> I'm just like I'm so desperate to have a ginnel or a cob or something <laughs> oh, a balm a balm cake, a balm cake. Is, is it middle class is that the affliction of another middle class I affliction it's is that like it's been we, homogenized I think it's because 
uh, um, the language of the southeast where I came from yes. was um, chosen as the standard. It was kind of, you mm. know, privileged. It, it, it fairly randomly, but it was just sort of London. There was this wonderful thing in English um, linguistic history called the Great Vowel Shift. Have you heard of this? Which right. changed pronunciation forever and it spelling and sound divorced forever, which is why English spelling is so difficult. Okay. As well as all the influences like Normans and various things. Um, but uh, the Great Vowel Shift really, we think, happened because London was the centre of fashion and they, Londoners started to speak a little bit differently to be cool and other people then followed them, but the, but the spelling didn't change. Uh, so I think that's, that's probably why I have all the boring standard stuff and I don't have any of the, you know, Wood lice is another fascinating one. People have so many different words for yes. wood lice up and down the country, like cheesy logs and chuggy pigs and things. What Did, did you call them wood lice? Yeah. Oh. It's so, so I humdrum. <laughs> I <laughs> know. It's terrible. I know. Isn't it? It's fine to be different. Um, so the, 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 something for everyone, really, with the two new books. Uh, the interesting stories about Curious Words, if, I haven't, if we haven't successfully conveyed what it is, it's, it's a compendium based entirely on your enthusiasm for, <laughs> yeah, for things that, that, that you want to find out more about. So, And what's really interesting, and I wonder why you think it is that people are so interested in this. So we do a thing on the radio show called Mystery Hour when it's, it's very basic. People ring in with a question and other people ring in with answers. But I had to make a rule very early on that you're only allowed one question a week about phrases or about Oh, really? Because you've because, got so many? Because otherwise oh, it would that. be complete. So someone would ring in mm. and say, why do we... Why do we say, you know, goes against the grain, which is in, in the new book? And then yeah. everyone else would follow that. They'd think, oh, I've got one of those. Oh, Whereas okay. with every other subject, it doesn't, it's not self-generating. It doesn't suddenly spawn. That. Yeah, so yeah. why? Why do people find it so interesting? Um, in other words, why are people going to buy interesting stories <laughs> about oh, Curious okay. Words? How can I sell my book? <laughs> um, well, I think it's because when you actually stop to think about some of the stuff that we say, it's mad it's just nonsensical um eccentric or or you like to think well what was the inspiration for that who was jack the lad mm. you know who's billy no mate um <laughs> for example and so when you when the studio you manager stop, on countdown isn't it, isn't billy it? No mate. <laughs> definitely poor billy um but jack the lad was a real person i actually drove past um tyburn Gosh. actually coming in today and uh, there was a um a folk hero called Jack Shepherd, who was a pickpocket um, in the 18th century, I think it was. Yeah. And he um, was notorious for his prison escape. So he got banged up so many times. Sometimes he'd be manacled to the floor, literally. He was known as Jack the Lad because he was a bit of a lad. He always managed to escape through these... I mean, I think there have been films made um, about Jack Shepherd. And... Um, Eventually, he was undone and he was hanged at, at Tyburn, mm. but he was the original Jack the Lad, yeah. So there are all these amazing stories, what I call the secret lives, really, behind everyday words. And I think once you start tapping into them, as you say, it's like this sort of, well, I hate to use the word tsunami because that's just very banal, but it, you, you just get lots and lots of different things popping into your head. And we're back to archaeology in a way, aren't yes. we? Yes. As well, in that it's, it's, it's in your own life and you can dig yeah. into... Something that you use every day and discover yeah. rich history that you had no Incredibly clue about. Rich history, um, a lot of which goes back centuries. Mm. Um, and as I said, it can be the most boring of words, like lasagna. I was explaining to Giles uh, Brandreth this morning, it used to mean chamber pot. Um, it comes from a Latin word for a pot, and then obviously someone was taking a dig at some cook's. Right. Dish, dish yes. and and called it like the contents of a chamber pot and that kind of stuff which is extraordinary um or it can be the metaphorical expressions where you think there's got to be something behind that like stealing someone's thunder or looking yeah, something into shape yeah. you know some some of the all-time favorites so yeah i just i just put in as many as i could muster and and they're both out this this all they're out now really aren't they both or um, well, by the time this goes out by the time out, this goes out yeah they're, they're out so will, interesting yeah. stories about curious words and, and roots of happiness 100 words for joy and hope. I usually end by asking people what ambitions they have left, but it strikes me, Susie Dent, that you'd, you'd never really had ambitions in the first place in the sense, <laughs> the normal sense of the word. Um, no, I mean, I don't... I think it would be unfair to myself, to my younger self, to say that I just fell into things. Because sure. I think I did... Uh, I definitely have tried to shape things, obviously, in, in ways that um, I, I wanted them to, yes. to go... But I equally have 
been incredibly lucky and I do have an ambition but it's not so much a worky one it's to be and I've had it all my life I feel like I'm getting a tiny bit better but very slowly it's to be less um vulnerable to uh criticism not criticism but just nasty stuff yes. you know um and you get so much of it actually <laughs> I should take a leaf out of your book but I need to care less what other people think yeah um I've done that ever since I was little and it is it is easing off a little bit but it's definitely still there do you not get that no not anymore no, no. so how how have you um I think accommodated yourself to everything that you get ther 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 therapeutically looking after little me who okay. cared desperately about what people thought about so it. You, okay, used to. And then as an adult, just being really clear about whose opinions I care about. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, it just having, it, whether I know them or not, mm. if you are a white supremacist, I'm not really going to be bothered no. by what you say about That's, me. And uh, even if yeah. you're quite a low-level toss pot, I'm really, <laughs> it didn't always used to be like that, but it's quite no. liberating when, when you get there. I'm struck though that everybody loves you, so what, what are you talking about? No, but then that, make, that raises the stakes even more, doesn't it? So you just think, oh my God, yes, it, I suppose all, it does. from there is going to be quite steep. Okay. Um, but yeah, okay, I think I think that's very true. Who was it who said um, that, uh, yeah, you should really care about what some anonymous yeah. bloke thinks about you on the internet? I think yeah, that is very true. Um, so thank you. And, and exposure helps, I guess. The volume that you deal with focuses the mind. So that's yes. that's not a professional ambition. Professionally, no. you just, can I please carry on as I am for a bit longer, please? I would love to carry yeah. on uh, and just, um, yeah, keep shouting about words and, um, yeah, keep writing. That's what I would absolutely love to do. We should just mention the podcast that you do with Charles Brandreth. You just referred oh, okay. to it as well, which also is a stage show as well, isn't it? That's your yeah, no, time. we stopped those actually. Have you stopped? Um, so you now do one do on your own. More, do, you, do you do a stage yeah, show? Yeah, I've been yeah. doing it, but I've been doing it since pre-COVID. It's the tour that never ends. Fantastic. Um, so uh, I love it. I absolutely love it, but I need to write a new one soon. Susie, don't thank you. Thank you very much for having me, James. Thank you.